Hello. This is a very interesting and very special components in the concurrent computing course. One of the major issue in concurrent computing is finding race conditions. In this component, we will explain it is nearly impossible to design some debuggers that is able to find race conditions for us. Therefore, we have to write our program in a very careful way. Just like uh, what Dijkstra said, if your program has a bug, it's not because your program has a bug, it's because you put that bug in. So, because catching race condition is very difficult. So it would be much better for us to not to add any race condition to our program. And this section uh, has two components or two units. We have a few terms in complexity theory uh, because this is not a formal language nor complexity theory course. So all the discussion will be very intuitive. So we'll use this term to illustrate the difficulty in catching race conditions. Then we're going to use a set of examples, gradually illustrate some ideas for catching possible race conditions. All of these attempts is based on a very simple problem. So I hope you still remember the definition of race condition. If a program produces non-deterministic results, there could be race condition. It does not mean it always has race conditions. So having non-determinic results does not always mean this program has race condition because the order of the execution of your statement in a concurrent or parallel program is determined by, a, by the CPU scheduler. So this defined or determined by an external factor. It's not our fault, we have to accept this. But a race condition produces non-deterministic. So this is very important concept for you to remember. A program that produces non-deterministic results may be the nature of a parallelly or concurrently execution program, executing program. But a program in which you put the one or two race conditions in, the results could be non-deterministic. I should say always be non-deterministic. We covered this in an earlier lecture. So see this, uh, slides for more details. So the definition of a race condition is the following. A race condition occurs if two or more processes or threads manipulate a shared resource concurrently. So here are a few keywords. You have to have at least two process or threats involved. They manipulate a shared resource. Now, manipulating a shared resource does not always mean you may have a race condition. These processes or threats must manipulate this shared resource in a concurrent way. Remember the meaning of concurrent is either interleave execution or parallel execution. So if we have two or more processes of threat manipulating shared resource concurrently and 
the outcome of the execution depends on the order in which the access takes place. As we mentioned in some previous lectures, synchronization is needed to prevent race condition from happening. So this is just a uh, recap. Always use instruction level interleaving to demonstrate the existence of race condition because higher level language statements are not atomic and can be switched in the middle of execution. Remember, we use C++ and C minus as an example. C++ actually is translated to load something at one and save something. So C++ at least could be translated to three machine instructions. And uh, CPU scheduling could occur anywhere between any two consecutive instructions. But for higher level language statement, you never see this. So instruction level in the living can show clearly the sharing of a resource among processes and a threat in particular in a concurrent way. So if you consider the higher level language stem C++ and C minus minus, because if you consider they are atomic, which is definitely not. So the execution of C++ or C++ C minus must either one would be executed before the other would happen. So the result would be always the same. But if you translate C++, to machine instruction and also translate C minus minus to machine instruction, CPU scheduling or interrupt could occur anywhere between any two consecutive instructions. So in this way, concurrent sharing can be vividly illustrated by interleave execution of machine instruction execution. Now, because we said, the outcome of the, the outcome or the result of, of execution determines by the order of the, of the uh, uh, manipulation that could take place. Therefore, different ordering of the execution of these machine instructions could generate different results. So how do we illustrate? We have two different results. We use one execution sequence to show, okay, under this order, we have one result. And then we slightly change the order of those machine instruction execution to get a different result. Then we illustrate the final result. The outcome depends on the order of execution. So this is extremely important concept. Two execution sequences are needed to show the answer depends on the order of execution. So now, I hope re remember the definition of race condition. So when you debug your program, how do we find bugs? Either you detect it statically or you detect it dynamically. For an example, a compiler can statically detect many issues in your source program, even uninitialized variables, right? So statically detecting race condition means we could write a program just like a compiler, which scans your source program and the reports where you may have or where you can find a race condition. In other words, we are able to write a program which scans your source program and pinpoint where, a, where is a race condition or where are the race condition with respect to certain uh, shared resource. Unfortunately, if your program 
uses multiple semaphores. This is a very, very difficult job. In complexity, to design such program with race condition debugger is MP hard. We will explain it. Therefore, no efficient algorithms are available so that you could take your source program, scans it, and then pinpoint where you have race condition exactly. As a result, the only way to avoid race condition is you design the programs carefully and use debugging skill wisely. On the other hand, dynamically detecting something is probably similar to you, you add many printf in your program. Adding so many printf or c out in your program at suspicious places, you print out certain values. Now, if the print out values are wrong, you know there could be a problem around that area. But this is even more difficult to do because when we switch the execution order of mes machine instruction, in order to access a shared resource, then every access, the hardware must be able to know, okay, I have a different order. But every time you, you run the program, you have only one order, right? So in this way, not only we need to ha have very special hardware, but also very difficult algorithm to find, to determine you have two or more processes accessing a shared resource in a concurrent way. And the results will be different from time to time. So this is nearly impossible again. Therefore, detecting race condition is an extremely difficult task. The only solution so far and the Turing machine model is you don't put race conditions into your program. And unfortunately, if you find out your program produces non-deterministic results, then you have to have some debugging skill to find it out. So this is the main purposes of this component. Then we move on to the explanation of certain uh, terms, P, MP, MP complete, MP hard. You will learn it in algorithm or formal model or formal language course. So here, the discussion is intuitive. You don't need any uh, previous learned knowledge to understand what's going on. So first of all, let's explain what a decision problem is. A decision problem is a problem that only needs a yes or no answer. For an example, given two numbers, A stored in A and B, is A greater than B? This is a decision problem. And given an array of some elements, so you pick the ith elements and ask, if the ice element is the third largest element, this is a decision problem. But sorting is not the decision problem. Because sorting asks for a sorted result. But anyway, we could ask a sequence of decision problem, usually to solve a non-decision problem. For an example, given an array of n elements. You pick the first one and ask a decision problem. Is this element the smallest one? If it is yes, you put it into the first location of the output array. And you pick the next, pro next element. Is this the second largest one? And so on and so forth. Or if the decision problem tells you that this is not the smallest element, you may ask, is the same element the second largest one, the third largest one? So eventually asking n questions, 
each of which would report you a yes or no answer. Then your sorting problem is solved by asking a sequence of decision problems. So as a result, a decision problem is very fundamental. In our discussion regarding P, NP, and so on. So let's take some example. Given a set of positive integers, are there any even numbers there or any odd numbers? So to solve the decision problem is rather easy. Let's say we pick even. Your test you see is the first one even. No, then it's the second one even. So if every number you ask is not even low, then you will know there's no even number in the data set. Now, example two, given a set of numbers, positive, zero, and a negative, is there a subset of that set that sums to zero? For example, suppose the subsets are four, one, negative three, and negative two. This subset of this set sums to zero. So the answer is yes. If the given set is this, if the answer is no with this subset. So there are so many problems in uh, algorithm analysis and the formal model or computation theory about this. You will learn, but for us, we only need to know the concept of decision problem. A decision problem is just a problem that will only need yes or no answer. Now, suppose we have a problem L. If this problem can be solved in polynomial time, that is, we could solve this problem in a polynomial number of steps. Each step only requires a um, constant in a finite time. This problem all of this problem would be collected into a class we call it P. For example, the problem we mentioned given a set, is there a even number? Is there an even number? So this problem can easily be solved by ask, uh, by checking every element. So we can solve this problem in linear time. So linear is of course a special case of polynomial. Therefore, finding whether a set has an even number is in the class P. So given a set, we, we pick a, a number, say X, is X a member of that set? You just compare N times, you know the, you know the answer. And, or you pick a element in the set. The question is, is this the third largest number? You can, of course, uh, solve this problem in polynomial time. So all of these problems are in the set of class P. So these problems are referred to as class P problems. So, is there an even or odd number in a set of n positive integers, you can easily design an algorithm to find the answer using order n comparisons. So the next one is a given array of n elements sorted. This is of course in class P. How do you know an array is sorted? You compare the first n element and that's the first and the second elements, if the first is less than the second, then you move to the second and the, and the third is the second less than third and so on. If every adjacent pair is sorted in ascending order, then you know the given array is sorted. So these are solvable problems because we are able to find algorithms that can solve this problem in polynomial time. Then we explain the concept of MP. Now, 
given a solution of a problem, decision problem, if we are able to verify whether that solution is actually a solution in polynomial time, this is a verifiable problem. In other words, we have a problem in hand. Decision problem, yes or no. Then, if you are able to verify whether that answer is a correct one, in polynomial time. So this problem is verifiable problem. For an example, given an array of n, n elements, we wish to know whether this array is sorted well with n minus one comparisons at worst. You know that array is sorted or not. So the problem that the problem asking whether a given array of integers is sorted is a verifiable problem. Now let's take a, a few more. Given a set of disjoint distinct integers, can it be partitioned into two disjoint set? Of course, you know you can, rather easy. So let's say given a set B S and let A and B be two possible partitions. It's very easy to verify the union of A and B is S and the intersection of A and B is empty in polynomial time. So of course, this has to be, the number of elements in this set has to be finite. Suppose A has M elements, B has N elements. So you take every element of A and compare it against every element in B. If all the comparison turns negative, that is any elements in A is not an element in B, then with M times N comparison, you are able to verify this, right? So now how do we verify this? Because A has M elements, B has N elements. Now suppose S has some other elements, say may, maybe not M plus N. If it's equal to M plus N, um, we can proceed. If the elements in S is greater than or equal or less than M, greater than n plus n, you know the union of a and b cannot be s. So how do we do? Say if the s number of elements in s is say k, you reserve an array of booleans. Initially, you initialize every element of this s array to false. Now for L, every element in a, you ask a question, is this element in A and elements in S? If it is a yes, then you mark the corresponding elements in S from false to true. So eventually, if every element in S is marked, you know the union of A and B is S. So this uh, partition problem is verifiable. So if we are able to guess a solution to a problem S and the verify it in polynomial time, L is the NP class. NT means non-deterministic polynomial. So the definition of this NP class is not only for determining, uh, not for decision problem, it's also for other problems as well. So as long as you are able to guess a solution, that is the problem is verifiable. If you are able to guess a solution to a problem L and verify it in polynomial time, L is an MP class. So 
what is the trick here? This keyword, guess. You can guess a solution and verify it. Verify may be easy, but guess a solution is even easier. You could randomly pick something and treat it as a guess and verify it. So this is the meaning of non-deterministic polynomial class in P. Obviously, class P is a subset of MP because every problem in P can be solved in polynomial time. You don't have to guess. Therefore, P is a subset of MP. One of the most challenging questions in computer science is whether P is equal to MP. If P is equal to MP, then every problem in computer science is solvable in polynomial time without guessing. In other words, or if this were true, then all problems in computer science would be easy to solve. The only difficulty is whether we can find such an algorithm. So this is one of the well-known millennium problems. You may visit this webpage to understand these millennium problems. If you are able to solve one of them, you will get $1 million and your name will be written in the history of computer science. So the next term we want to discuss is MP completeness. A problem L is in the MP complete class if L is in MP. So L requires you to guess a solution and verify it in polynomial time. And then every problem H in MP is reducible to L in polynomial time. The keyword is reducible. That is, you pick a problem H in the MP class. You are able to convert the problem H in polynomial time to the problem L. In other words, if you are able to solve L, you are able to solve H. So MP class, contains the problems that are the hardest. Here, the MP complete is here, and any problem in MP in the MP class could be converted to L. So just a note, every problem in MP complete class could be converted to each other because they are also in H, uh, also in MP. So the MP complete class has the hardest problem in computer science. If you can solve one of them, you can solve all problems in the MP class. So here we assume that P is not equal to MP, which is the belief of many computer scientists. Now, the last term is MP hardness or MP hard. A decision problem L is MP hard if every problem H in MP is reducible to L in polynomial time. Notice here, we didn't say L is going to be in MP. So here is a diagram showing you that this is the MP class and there is a subset of problems in MP class. Every problem in H can be reduced or converted to a problem in MP. But MP hard means, well, MP hard is a, pro is a set. Every problem in H could be re reduced 
to L. This L does not have to be in NP. So we have this portion, this meniscus shape is outside of the NP. So NP hard has even harder problem. And we also assume that P is not equal to NP. So NP hard class contains those hardest problems that may not be in NP. And NP complete class contains those hardest problems in NP. So as you can see, NP hard is even harder. So this is what you want to know. Designing an algorithm that can find or raise conditions in a program accurately is an NP hard problem here. Now, what if your program uses only one semaphore? Well, that is easy to solve, but that is not an up subject in this course. So, you know, finding risk, how hard it is for finding race condition in a program using multiple semaphores. Then we're going to look at some examples where I will provide you some of my experience to find race conditions in your program. Now, in the remaining uh, slides, we use a single problem to illustrate the whole concept. We have two groups of threads or process, A and B. Processes in group A and B exchange messages. Each process in A runs a function TA. Each process in B runs a function TB. Both functions, TA and TB, have an infinite loop and never stop. In the following, we show execution sequences that cause race condition. You may always find other execution sequences without race condition. So that means the execution of this example has a non deterministic result. And when we discuss each attempt to solve this problem, you'll see we have something being shared concurrently. So if you are able to show two instances that could cause different results and we are done. Then what? Showing the existence of a race condition. So the code looks like this. Uh, group A, TA, group B, GB. And we have loop. In every loop, um, we do something and execute exchange exchange message. This guy in A exchange ex, uh, message with a, a guy in B and so on. But we have to write our program in a very careful way. When a process in A makes a message available, it can continue only if it receives a message from a process in B who has successfully retrieved A's message. For an example, I am a process in A, you are a process in B. I make a message available to you for you to retrieve. I can continue only if you retrieve my message. And of course, I will get your message as well. Similarly, when a message, when a process in B makes a message available, it can continue only if it receives a message from a process in A who has successfully retrieved B's message. So just like uh, I am from Apple, you are from Microsoft. We meet at a uh, conference. We don't know each other. And then I show uh, Mr. B uh, and Mr. A, this is my business card. 
And then you tell me I am Mr. B. Hi, Mr. A. This is my business card. At this end, at the end of this uh, business cards exchange, I get your call. You get my call. This is a correct one. But it's possible that I am Mr. A1, you are Mr. B. And I have a partner, A2, who is who could be very aggressive. So I present my car to you saying that I am Mr. A1 and Mr. B, how are you? This is my business card. What if Mr. A2 is very aggressive? Before you take my car, A2, that is Mr. B, uh, A2's message overrides mine. As a result, what do you get? You get Mr. A2's call. So suppose uh, Mr. B or you successfully get my car, that is Mr. A1's car. Is it possible that when you present your message, I did not get it. Instead, the aggressive guy A2 picks us up. So in, in both cases, we have it, we have incorrect message exchange. That is, of course, incorrect. So in the following, we will show you four attempts. Each one is better than the previous one. These solutions were taken from student exam papers. When I taught in operating system courses, so student presented this answer to this problem. Therefore, you may also make the same mistake. So this is the first solution, which is the worst. So we have two semaphores, A and B, both initialized to zero. And we have two buffer, buffer A and buffer B. Buffer A is used to hold the message of generated by Mr. A. On the other hand, buffer B is the area or the variable used to hold the message generated by Mr. B. So the idea here is Mr. A is symmetric, so I will only discuss here. Mr. A produces a message and put into a local variable, let's say VA. Then the semaphore A and B are used to inform the other party that my message is ready waiting for you. So here, uh, Mr. A signals Ms. A, Mr. B, indicating that I am ready and then wait on a semaphore until you are ready. Then if you are ready, I put my message into my buffer and then retrieve your message from your buffer and save into my local variable. So this is something like, that. hey, Mr. B, I am Mr. A, I am ready to do a message exchange with you. Uh, of course, I don't know which Mr. B I will be meeting. But anyway, I won't wait for a Mr. B to contact me. Now, if a Mr. B contacts me here, I know that Mr. B is ready. Then I have my message in my uh, buffer and then retrieve the information out of the buffer from Mr. B's. Well, I hope you could stop here, pause the for a while and find out what went wrong in this solution. I'm telling you the solution is incorrect. So please pause until you find the answer.
Okay. I hope you did not continue immediately. Thinking how to find this and find the problem is important. Okay. So as we mentioned, we have to use uh, execution sequence to illustrate the whole thing. But because we know some are for signal and some are for weight of atomic, and therefore there's no problem we use uh, directly this instructions, uh, this atomic instructions here. So here, a Mr. A comes in telling Mr. B that, oh, okay, I am ready waiting for you here. And then Mr. A or third day is blocked because no Mr. B is there. And then a Mr. B comes in saying that a Mr. A, I am ready. So this signal, a dot signal would cause this waiting A to be released. And then after signaling an A, this threat B would be potentially blocked here. However, because this B was signaled by A here, therefore B has the potential to be continued immediately. Then CPU scheduler or interrupt come into the play. Then what if, what if the CPU scheduler picks A to run because A is released here. So A generates its value into buffer A and then A immediately retrieve the value of buffer B into its local area. But as you know, B hasn't generated this message yet. Therefore, what threat A receive is probably garbage stored in buffer B. Or the message generated by the previous B, isn't it? So if you switch the order, you get different results. For an example, B generates information here and uh, uh, get A's information here and then B is here. So it, even more complex, you may use instruction level. And that is an assignment for you to do. So I hope you understand the problem in this attempt. Uh, please pause if you do not understand it or even rewind a little bit then listen it again. Then I will show you a more complex issue. This time we have two A's, A1 and A2, and the two B's, B1 and B2 involved. So here, A1 steps in saying that, hey, a B, I am ready, waiting for you. And then for whatever reason, probably an interrupt or a, a CPU scheduling, A1 is suspended. And the CPU scheduler picks B1 to run. And D1 will say, hey, a Mr. A, I am ready. And D1 execute B dot wait. Does B1 have to wait? Not necessarily, because A1 has already signaled this B. So even B1 does not have to wait. CPU scheduler could switch B1 out and then giving the CPU to A2. Now A2 would say, hey, Mr. B, I am ready to exchange a message and waiting for you. Oops, there is a problem. Does A2 have to wait? No, because A has already been signaled by B1. 
So what A2 receives is the signal generated by V1. But if the CPU scheduler is so tricky, that does not allow A2 to run. Instead, the CPU scheduler get B1 to run. So B1 put this information into uh, buffer B. And right after that, CPU scheduler switches B1 to, uh, switches B1 out and then switches B2 in. So B2 signal A dot signal. So B2 is switched out, but A1 comes in. A1 does not have to wait. A1 was switched out here. So A1 execute A dot wait, or A1 of course does not have to wait. And A1 is so fortunate that the scheduler allows it to continue. So A1 puts the information into buffer A, and then A2 is able to retrieve the information into buffer A. Hmm. What information A2 would retrieve? Oh, put this local information into buffer A, sorry. So A1 gets its information into buffer A, and then A2 gets its info information into buffer A. Look here. Buffer A is being shared concurrently. So if A1 put one into buffer A, before buffer A's information is retrieved by either B1 or B2, A2 is put a new information into buffer A. Destroys the previous one. Now, if you switch these two, you get a different result. Again, we have a risk condition, a very serious one. The problem is due to this four threats interaction. So please study this execution sequence and construct a different one in order to show non-deterministic output and concurrent sharing. So please don't continue to the next attempts. I hope you understand this. So what did we learn? First thing first, buffer A is shared not only among all processes in A, but also shared with all processes in B. Processes in A put the information there, processes in B retrieve the information there. So if there are shared data items, always protect them properly. Without a proper mutual exclusion, race conditions are likely to occur. Look at the previous one. So in this first attempt, both global variable buffer A and buffer B are shared and should be protected. I hope you understand this. Then we move to attempt two. This is also a solution I copied from a student exam paper. Now we know the previous solicitors, there was no protection at all. So this guy came up with a uh, sort of interesting solution. Now we have a mute, mute text, which is used to protect buffer A and buffer B. We only use one mute text, which is used to protect both buffer A and a buffer B. So the solution goes as follows because they are symmetric. So I only discuss this portion. So I said, hey, Mr. B, I am ready for message in the change and wait for you. Once you tell, you tell me you are ready, then I lock the buffer and generate my information into the buffer and then release the buffer. Okay, now buffer A has my information. Of course, the next step is getting your information. So here 
is exactly the same as the previous. It says, hey, Mr. B, I have already had my information in buffer A and wait for you to provide your information. And if you signal me, then I lock buffer B in order to retrieve the information into my local variable. So study this and find out whether this is a good solution or a correct one. And also think about this. Do we have any protection? So answer two questions. Five, the risk condition. And two, are there are any real protections here? So before you continue, please pause for a while. Okay, if you are here, I assume you have studied. In my previous classes, uh, previous years, many students can find um, this kind of a race condition right after you understand all attempts. But this one is a bit more complex. So let's say we have two A's, A1, A2, and a B. So three threats are involved. So A1 says, says hey, Mr. B, I am ready for message exchange and uh, waiting for you. And get switched out. And then a Mr. B comes in. Mr. B says, hey, a Mr. A, I am ready and uh, waiting for you. Okay, yes, you know, now we have A1 and A2 has the potential to execute. For A1, this signal release A1. And for this B, this signal from A1 release it. Unfortunately, due to the non-determinist nature in CPU scheduling and so, and in a system, we don't know which one will continue. What if the CPU scheduler picks A1 to run? And a1 saves this information into buffer A. And immediately, A1 is switched out, probably due to a, an interrupt. And then the CPU scheduler gives the control back to B. Now, B generates its information in the buffer B. So far, so good. And then another interrupt puts B on hold. And then A2 stop running. And unfortunately, the CPU scheduler picks A2 rather than A1 or B. So A2 says that, Mr. A, A, Mr. B, I am ready and waiting for you. And that's switched up. Of course, A2 must be switched up because previous a dot weight was here. So it would reduce the value to negative one. So A2 has to be stopped. Then B after putting information into buffer B, thread B goes into the next stage because B has already made some information into buffer B. It's going to tell the A that, okay, and my information is ready, I'm going to get yours. So B execute A dot signal. Which threads among A1 and A2 would receive this signal? It's A dot signal, definitely not A1 because A1 has not reached there yet. Therefore, this A dot signal is received by A2. That's a big problem because for B, for B, this set of A dot signal and B dot way is supposed to be used by A1 in the second stage. But in this execution sequence, B's second stage is picked up by A2's first stage. And A2 is able to access buffer A 
before buffer A's message is retrieved and ruin this. So A2's activity destroys A1's. You may want to say, hey, this is a higher level language statement you said. You have to use uh, instruction level. But of course, given this, you can easily construct a uh, machine instruction level interleaving. You just translate to uh, move or something, and you carefully rearrange the machine instructions here. You know the result will be different. So please pause before you fully understand this. So here, the problem is your protection doesn't work very well because we have two sections in each threads. First one is for adding my information into my own buffer. The second one is to retrieve the other guy's information. So the other guy could have a second section's signal picked up by a different A's first section that the whole thing becomes incorrect. So please do not continue until you fully understand the whole thing. So what did we learn from here? Improper protection is no better than no protection because it gives an, an illusion that data have been well protected. And we frequently forget that protection is done by a critical section, which cannot be divided. More precisely, execution in the protect critical section must be autonomous. So previously, we have to project buffer A and buffer B, but we cut it into two. One section for buffer A, the other section for buffer B, which is technically wrong. Now, third attempt. The first, if this problem is worth of 10 points, the first attempt could only get the probably two to three points. The second one is a little bit better, but I can only give it probably four points, not even 50%. But this one is, it is interesting, which I am able to give it a five or even six points. So here we use a uh, four semaphores, A ready, B ready, initialized to one. A done and B done, initialized to zero. A ready is used to establish mutual exclusion in a slightly different way. A ready is only used by threads in A. B ready is only used by thread in B. So because the initial value of A ready is one, therefore only one A can be here. Therefore that A, which can enter the A ready dot weight is the only one A here. So it has the exclusive access to buffer A and the buffer B. By the same reason, B ready is used to block any B. So we only allow one B here. And then once the A gets here, this A knows that I am the only one that can perform message exchange with the only one B here. Therefore, I generate my message and say that A has done my message. I am waiting for you so that you could get your message generated. And then if you tell me your message is generated, I retrieve your stuff. Isn't much better than the previous one. And that's why I would say, I'm willing to give five or even six points. If the 
elaboration is good. So please pause and uh, find the problem. So if you are here, I am sure you, you probably could have done something, but this execution sequence shows you a very interesting concept. You should happen in a uh, program, a concurrent program, even it could be written by a seasoned programmer. Now let's take a look at A and B. We only use one A and one B. I cannot put every uh, statements here, so I only provide the needed part. And because A ready and B ready is used for mutually exclusive uh, execution of uh, adding information to buffer A and, and uh, retrieve information of the buffer B. So I take that part out. So uh, suppose that A successfully enter a ready, generate the information into buffer A, and tells B that I am done with my information and wait for yours. Of course, A must wait because the initial value of B done and A done are ones. And then B starts running. B successfully passes B ready, put information here and execute B done. This signal would cause A to continue. And then B execute A done. Because A done has been signaled by A here, so B has the potential to continue. So it is the scheduler's choice what, whether to allow A to continue or B to continue or some other set to continue. But this time, thread A is chosen. And thread A successfully moved the information in buffer B into its local information. The information was generated here. So A successfully gets B's information. But B is still here. Well, it's already out of the weight, but it's suspended by the CPU scheduler. So A exit by calling A ready. So once A successfully executes A ready, so the next A could come in, right? Of course, it's right. The who's going to come in? It could be the exiting A. So if the exiting A comes back so fast and uh, execute a ready dot wait. Well, there could be other A's waiting on the a ready semaphore. But if things could go wrong, it will eventually go wrong. So this A comes back and join a ready dot wait. Yeah. It's so unfortunate that the mechanism built into the semaphore picks the same A to run again. So the same A put the information into buffer A before B can retrieve it. So this one completely overrides the previous value. So by the time B can get them that value, the value is the wrong one. So this is referred, usually referred to as fast runner. When you get out, usually it means uh, we have done something and then we're going to do something else. If that something else is so short, you got your comeback and saw the next run. It's possible that some fast runner could enter the same mutual exclusion section again and ruin the information it generated previously. So please stop before you fully understand it. So what did we learn? 
mutual exclusion for group A may not prevent processing group B from interacting with a processing group A and vice versa. So we saw a process in group B interact with the same process in group A twice. So it's the common that we protect the shared item from one group and forget other possible unintended access. That is fast run or coming back and ruin it. So protection must be applied uniformly to all processes rather than within groups. And thus you know, it's a correct solution. So let's move on to the fourth attempt. This fourth attempt is essentially the same, but this smart guy provides a really interesting solution. I'm going to give this solution seven to eight points. And if that person's elaboration is good, maybe even nine points. Of course, this is wrong. It won't get uh, 100%. So again, the uses are the same. The only difference is, remember in attempt three, we have A ready here, B ready here. Uh, this guy just switched this two. So process B waits for B ready. And thus everything as if it's doing in the third attempt. And finally execute B ready. And the B is waiting for A ready. B waiting for A ready means B waits until this A finishes everything. So this fast runner, even though when it comes back to execute be ready dot wait, it will be blocked because B, before B can execute this be ready, this A will be blocked. Okay, so this is what, why I said this is a rather good solution, but of course still incorrect. So here, please study this solution and also think about what would happen if A ready has one initial value one and B ready has initial value zero. Now, before we go, uh, you pause, remember this is a pattern we learned long time ago. In the concept discussion of semaphore, is it a, a printing one, two, one, two, one, two? Right, print one and allow uh, process two to print two and switch back to one. So as I mentioned to you so many times, the example which we chose to be discussed here can be served as a template for you too to, to be used in your solution. So please pause and study what went wrong in this program. Okay, again, it's still incorrect interaction. Look at here, A1 starts. So A1 execute dot wait, it does not have two because initial value of B rate is one. And then puts the information there, tells a B that A is done and then switched up. At the same time, B enters, passing uh, a ready dot wait. So it is information here and tells A1 that I'm done preparing my information and then execute A done dot wait. Now, because this A done has been signaled here, so B has the potential to continue, right? Fine. Now B can continue and uh, the CPU does select B to continue. So B removed the information stored in buffer A here to its local information. And then B execute B ready, telling that the next A I'm done, but what if the next A is A2? 
So the previous A hasn't finished its work. And if B execute B ready dot signal, B ready dot signal currently has a value zero. Now, if you signal it, well, B ready becomes one and A2 continues. Whoops, we have a problem. A2 gets B's information rather than by A1. So although we look pretty good, one, two, one, two, one, two, but we simply does not address the issue. The interaction pattern is wrong. Even though A1 is in, is, uh, even though A1 passes B ready, before it can finish everything, B could signal B ready again, allowing the next A to continue. So essentially A1 and A2 are executing that sequence of statement. You don't know what would happen. So please study uh, this solution before you continue. So what did we learn? Usually when we uh, want to enforce uh, mutual exclusion, we use locks. In the lock, only the owner can lock and the unlocked lock. Remember that? We talk about this in a lecture on third mentor, new text lock. Now in this solution, A ready is acquired by a process in A, but released by a process in B. That is, you successfully lock the lock of a critical section, or is instead we use semaphore. You successfully pass through the semaphore weight that is used to enforce mutual exclusion. But semaphore does not have a owner. While you are still in your critical section, you think that's critical section, I can unlock it. I, as an outsider, can signal that semaphore, allowing the next one to do and mess up everything. So this example showing to you why mutual exclusion is usually implemented by the use of locks rather than semaphores. Then you may ask, hey, you presented four attempts, none of them being correct. So is this problem solvable? Or even though it's solvable, is the solution an easy one? Now you definitely would ask this question. No problem. I simply tell you, this problem does have a rather simple solution. Now think about this. Message exchange, I provide you my message and you provide me your message. So if I provide you with, if I generate message allowing you to retrieve, then I am a producer. You are a pro consumer. And then you provide your message for me to retrieve. You are a producer and I am a consumer, right? So basically, this message exchange problem is a double producer consumer problem. Do you agree? I'm sure you have to agree. I give you the message, I am the producer and you are a consumer. And you give me your message, you are a producer, I am the consumer, right? Because we only exchange one message, uh, that producer and consumer problem is a bounded buffer problem with only one buffer slot. Hope you remember this. So with this concept in mind, we just do this. You know how to write a solution for the bounded buffer problem. You could write a class. And then the, when you initialize that class, you provide how many slots should be there, just one. And then you provide two functions, put and get. So 
Here, bounded buffer is just a class. We call it buffer A and buffer B. So thread A would execute this call put, put my information into buffer A. After doing that, this is a, hey, Miss A, Mr. B, I have my information there available in buffer A. And then retrieve the information from buffer B. Buffer B is where you put your information in. For buffer B, uh, for thread B, you put your information into buffer B, allowing me to get it. So you execute a get in order to retrieve in to retrieve the information I generated here, right? It's very easy. Conceptually, it's this easy. But the question is, does it work? Please pause and think about it before I continue. Unfortunately, even though we have a very good initial step, this is an incorrect solution. Now let's take a look at it. Thread A put the information in the buffer A and switched out. At the same time, uh, thread B put the information in the buffer B and thread B continues. B is able to retrieve the, the information of the buffer A generate here into buffer B. Now, uh, uh, put it in, retrieve the information from buffer A into this local variable. And then thread B is done. While A1 just finished 50% of its task. Now keep this in mind, buffer A has been retrieved here. So due to the, uh, the semantic of the uh, bounded buffer, so because buffer A is now empty, Thread A2 could put information into buffer A, right? Always remember, a bounded buffer has a mechanism to monitor whether the buffer is empty or not. Now this get in thread B or empties the contents in buffer A. Therefore, when thread A2 execute put, this put is going to be successful. Now, if the CPU scheduler allows get to continue. So A2 retrieves information from buffer B, which is generated here by B. But this buffer B information is supposed to be retrieved by A1, right? So we still have a problem. Now, is this pattern similar to one of the previously discussed four attempts? Yes, please figure it out. If you are able to figure it out, you know how to solve this problem elegantly. Please pause until you are able to figure it out. Okay, remember, I have warned you that every time we should only allow one process to do their work and we should not protect the critical section separately. That's fine, of course. Therefore, we have a new text, a semaphore. Whenever a process is here to do message exchange, so in order we make the whole area in a critical section. Process A, wait for this mutex before they can start message exchange after it's done, it signals. So process B uses the same mutex. Hmm. Is this solution correct? I know many of you will say, this is ridiculously wrong. Yes, it's ridiculously wrong, but think about it before you continue. If a thread passes put, adding information into, let's just pick this one. If process A successfully gets through this weight mutex, so process A 
is the only one here. No other A nor B can enter. So process A puts information into buffer A. And then when it gets, try to execute get to retrieve information into buffer B. Can this A continue? Well, this A would be blocked forever here because it successfully get information here and waiting for something to be generated into buffer B and no one here can con can enter and generate this information because this new text has been locked. Do you understand this? So we have that lock. So now, before you continue, think one important thing again. This pattern is similar to one of the four attempts, right? Isn't it? If you don't remember it, get back a few slides or you use your um, slides available on, on the web. It's similar to one of the four attempts. So that attempt, I said, oh, reasonable, but incorrect. And then we talk about a better solution. Remember that? In other words, we, can, uh, we cannot lock the whole thing up. If we lock the whole thing up, we have a deadlock. So before you continue, stop and find out how to overcome this problem. Okay. So this is attempt three. We use one summer for a mutex so that only one A can be here. And we use B mutex so that only one B here. So this is attempt three. But you may think that, hey, attempt three was an incorrect solution. This one is probably still incorrect. But I can tell you this one is a correct one. Why is it correct? Attempt three was incorrect because of the A done, B done were done incorrectly. But here, whether a process can deter, can continue actually is determined by the semantic built into the bounded buffer. So if something is here, A will be blocked. And uh, until B puts something here, it is A can continue. Is it possible for a fast runner to come back? Before B retrieves the information, no. Because if a fast runner comes back, yes, it could pass through A mutex, but buffer A is still full. Before this buffer A is being retrieved by A B. So definitely the bounded buffer mechanism helps us to overcome this incorrect interaction problem. The interaction is implemented by the bounty buffer. So as I mentioned, before a thread A finishes a message exchange, no other threads in A can start a message exchange. If A1 put a message and B has a message available, it's impossible for any A2 to retrieve B. And if A2 can retrieve B's message, A2 must be in the critical section while A1 is about to execute get, right? This is impossible because A1 is already in the critical section that is built by a new text. So this is a correct section. It illustrates again and again that even though the problem looks complex, if you are able to find or map one of the uh, example we discussed to your to the problem in your hand, you might be able to modify the exist one of the existing classical problem to be used in your solution. So now, 
you may want to say, hey, that solution requires us to use a bounded buffer mechanism. That doesn't look like very uh, elegant. Is there some way we can come in, we can come up a elegant solution? Yes, of course. A naive way would be you write all the needed statements, you replace all the needed statements, say uh, replace B uh, put and get by all the needed statement. That's it. So this is the bounty buffer solutions for n slots in these sort of statement for uh, put in these sort of statement for get, right? So we have seen this a long time ago. So now because we only use one buffer elements, so we simply set that the buffer size to one. Therefore, the not for sum of four is initial value one because the initial value was set to the number of slots. Now we only need one. So because the buffer has only one element, we don't get an array, which is use a buffer. And because we have only one element, we don't need the, the in pointer and out pointer. We don't have the handler. The buffer is either full or empty. So in this case, we simply duplicate everything in a bounty buffer. We have two buffers, uh, for A, empty A, mutex A, and for B, empty B and mutex B. And we use again a mutex here so that only one A can be in this part. A B mutex here so that only one B can be in this part. So this section is put variable A into buffer A. This section is get the value in buffer B into buffer A. Hmm. That looks a, a little bit clumsy, right? So if you can, you can get to this point, hmm, pretty good. But because you are a computer science student, your programs have to be more elegant. So study this not so elegant program. We used how many semaphores? One, two, three, four, five, six. And we used mutex A in for a buffer A, mutex for mutex B for buffer B. Can we simplify this a little bit? Please study this solution and hopefully you are able to simplify it. I would claim that mutex A and mutex B are not needed, so we can we are able to remove one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight synchronization based uh, statement. That would save us a whole lot of uh, waiting and signal time, or at least we could remove four places where the wait must be executed. Now, please pause and see whether you understand what I mean. Now look at here. This is for B, this uh, buffer B, this is buffer A, this is for buffer A, and this is for buffer B. Now, this is a critical section projected by buffer A. This is a critical section also projected buffer uh, by mutex A. Can an A here, a B here, be in this critical section at the same time? That's the key. Can they? Can an A be here, a, a B here at the same time? I will tell you, no, it can't. If a B is here, if a if B here reach this one, it means it has successfully uh, passed a signal not empty B, right? 
So only one A can pass not four A. So only one A can be here for sure. And after this one is done, it will signal not empty A, allowing this B to go. So this A would execute not empty B, waiting for this signal. So in other words, this A, which is executing here, has already produced information into buffer A. Even though this guy can come back, can, uh, can go here, is waiting for A to get information in. Therefore, this B is waiting for not empty A. So a B can reach mutex A only after an A signals not empty A here. So who signal this? Well, here. So that means when B can be here, this A has already exited its critical section. Okay, so could it be the next one to come in? No, because after signaling this, this one is here in order to retrieve the information. This one could come back, but before this B can successfully retrieve not for A, the next A cannot continue. Therefore, we can remove these four pairs of weight and signal. Please review this part and make sure you understand why. Now, after removing this uh, mutex A and mutex B, this solution looks pretty easy, right? Much easier than all previous four attempts. And because thread A and thread B, the statement looks symmetric except some variable name. The weight and signal patterns in A and the weight and signal pattern in B are symmetric. Let me call this a symmetric solution. Now, can we simplify it further? Yes, of course. As long as we are willing to think differently. So here, a solution does not have to be symmetric. Remember when we talk about thine philosopher's problem, we discuss it lefty, righty, or weirder solution. That solution is not symmetric, and then we develop a whole lot of a symmetric solution. But here, we develop a symmetric solution first. However, a solution does not have to be symmetric. So we could allow A to be active and B to be passive. What does that mean? It means B waits for A's message, gets A's message, and then offers B's message for A to retrieve. Then A gets this message. So the pattern goes as follows. A still same. We allow only A here, only one B here. So A puts its information into buffer A and then gets its information. Now, because information in buffer A is available, B can retrieve its information into a temporary variable and then immediately puts in, uh, put its information into buffer B while A is waiting here. So A's pattern is put and get. B's pattern is get and put. So this get retrieve information here. After this put, A is blocked, waiting for B's execution of this put. And then B cop is a temporary variable uh, back to its variable B. We cannot override this B here because uh, B 
will be used to put the information into buffer B. Okay, so study this pattern. And if you are willing to do that, you just replace the put and the get with the same technique we mentioned earlier. So here, I'm going to do it for you. It's very simple. Look there, we don't use any mutex A and mutex B for mutual exclusion, because there's no sharing. So please study this before you continue. So this symmetric solution has six statements in this critical section. And that the asymmetric solution has four in thread A and two in thread B. So because statements in the asymmetric solutions are executed sequentially, there are six statements. In terms of statement count, both versions are similar. Now, because this symmetric solution has four weights and that the asymmetric solution has two, in terms of efficiency, the asymmetric solution seems to be better. On the other hand, because the message exchange sections are identical in both groups, the asymmetric, the symmetric version may be easier to understand. So now, from developing four attempts with some uh, execution statement showing that each of these um, four attempts being incorrect, then we map the producer and the consumer problem into, uh, into our problem and then solve it quite easily. Then if you, you want, we could simply rewrite uh, the boundary buffer solution to make it uh, the A a program without any boundary buffer class. And then we simplified it into a symmetric solution. Now, if we think slightly differently, we come up with a simpler solution. Whether which one is, is easy to, under, to understand it's your choice. But anyway, we eventually come up to very simple solution anyway. So what do we learn? The most important lesson is that the classical problems we discuss can serve as models to solve other problems. So that means you have to un understand the details of each of these uh, classical problem in order to extract the needed component to be used in your application. Many problems are variations or extensions of the classical problem. Therefore, analyzing your work in hand and finding similarity with one or more classical problem is a very important skill so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Of course, the four attempts illustrate some commonly seen skills to find possible race conditions. So conclusion, detecting race conditions is difficult because it's an empty heart problem. Therefore, detecting race condition is heuristic, more or less based on your skill. Incorrect mutual exclusion is no better than no mutual exclusion. Race conditions are sometimes very subtle. They may appear at unexpected places. Also, make sure some fast runners could cause problems. So that's the end of this lecture. It, it's a little bit long, but you could watch it uh, multiple times each time you, you do a section. So before next time, let me 
stop here, and good luck for you. Hope you learn some tricks for fighting race conditions, and goodbye.